going to talk to you about climate models and reanalyses, as Juliana said. Um, move this out of the way. Okay, so I'll start with climate models. So most of this talk is going to be about climate models, and then I have a shorter section on reanalyses at the end. So I thought I would start off just with this um, animation, which is showing you know, what we what a climate model generates. So it's like a, a simulation of the Earth, the Earth's climate, and you can see that it simulates all the clouds and all the weather systems moving across, like the depressions, and you have some tropical systems moving the other way, and, and the colors are, are rain, and then you can also see the snow in the background. So yeah, this is what we get out of the climate model. This particular climate model is a 10 kilometer resolution global model, which is really high resolution. The global models usually they are more like 100 kilometers. So this is really kind of on the edge of what we're able to do. So what is a climate model? Well, I mean, we also call them a GCM, which can stand for general circulation model or a global climate model. And they're a numerical representation of the Earth's climate system. So they have a 3D grid like this, only in reality, they have more vertical levels than this. And on this grid, it, it solves equations to do with the physics of the climate system. So things like conservation of mass, energy, and momentum. You have the Navier-Stokes equations of fluid motion, and they have to take into account the fact that the Earth is rotating. So it describes the exchange of like um, air, sorry, um, momentum and energy and wind and stuff between the grid cells and, and so on. And there's also lots of other processes too, like to do with radiation and how it interacts with aerosols or greenhouse gases and the exchanges of momentum, heat and water between the atmosphere and the ocean. And then you have precipitation and, and so on. So the grid cells are generally 100 kilometers in global models. Um, I mean, the most advanced ones we have that we can use for climate projection timescales, so like a century or two, tend to be 25 kilometers. And if we have regional models, then they can be even higher resolution, say 11 or even two, that's pretty high resolution. So in this um, diagram, it's just to show the kind of different components that the climate model represents. So this is an example from the NCAR model. So you have like incoming solar radiation and you have clouds and um, precipitation, evaporation, runoff. You can have vegetation, snow cover, and then you have like ocean currents and winds and thermohaline circulation and all that kind of stuff. So they're pretty complicated things which include a lot of processes. And we also expect them to be able to simulate like weather phenomena, climate phenomena like depressions and the jet stream and modes of variability like the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which has to do with the uh, sea surface temperatures in the Pacific. And I'll say a bit more about that later. So climate models have become more complicated with time. So to start with, they were quite simple and they just had a atmosphere only, they didn't have kind of other components like an ocean or anything like that. And then as time went on, um, more components were added. So now we have clouds and the land surface and um, we tell it where the ice is. And then, so in these, these panels, the far, star, tar, and all that, those are IPCC reports. So this is the first assessment report, second assessment report, third assessment report, and the fourth, we're actually on the sixth. The sixth is in preparation now, so this figure is slightly out of date, but yeah, so then we, there was a, a simple ocean was introduced and then later a more complicated ocean and um, representation of sulfate emissions and volcanic eruptions. And then later we have a carbon cycle, we have rivers, we have um, an ocean which can do the thermohaline circulation, we have aerosols, and then by AR4 there was also chemistry happening in the atmosphere and interactive vegetation. So yeah, modern climate models can 
include a lot of different components. And so I'll say something about parameterization. So basically, um, because climate model grids are pretty big generally, say 100 kilometers, and some processes happen on scales which are smaller than that, say convection or clouds, maybe they're a few kilometers and aerosols are really tiny, and then ocean eddies and turbulence are also quite small scale. So we can't represent these explicitly in the climate model, so we have to parameterize them, which means that we kind of have simplified equations to represent the average effects for the grid box or sometimes we might not totally understand a process so we have to um, approximate based on empirical relationships so that means like observed relationships and some of these parameterizations they have parameters in them which is like the values sometimes we're not totally sure what the value should be so we can tune the climate model to alter these these values to try and get it to simulate the most realistic climate possible. On this side, this is just like a visual representation of some of the things I already said. So you have a big convective cumulonimbus cloud on here, which has to be parameterized. And then you have the aerosols interacting with the sunlight and that's parameterized too. So I'll leave it at that for examples. So a bit about um, the, the models, so they're run on supercomputers. So this is a picture of the UK Met Office Cray supercomputer. And the models themselves are like a million lines of code. It's um, often Fortran. Sometimes it can be like a C, like a C or C plus or something like that. Um, and a lot of work goes into climate models. So the, the accumulated work of hundreds of scientists over multiple decades. It can take months to run a climate model. It depends on the resolution and on how complex it is, like how many different processes we take into account, like the Earth system or just the atmosphere or, or whatever. And it, they generate a lot of data that you then have to store somewhere. So um, I will talk a bit about um, the inputs to climate models, but one important point I want to make is that um, climate models simulate their own weather and climate variability. We don't tell them that they should simulate it. It just kind of emerges from the equations that they solve at the grid point scale. And then some boundary conditions like knowing where the continents are or where the sea is and that kind of thing. So what we do put into climate models in terms of data, we have to give them some initial conditions, which is the starting point. So for this, you could use, for example, observations on a given day. You so see you tell the climate model like the starting values of you know, temperature and pressure and, and so on over the world and then you set the model going and then it does its own thing from that point. Um, we we uh, give the climate models what we call external forcing agents. So these can be human or natural. So things like greenhouse gases, anthropogenic aerosols and land use changes are anthropogenic external forcing agents. And then natural ones can be volcanic aerosols, solar variability and orbital variations. And we also tell the, the models where the, the mountains are, where it's land and, and where it's ocean. And then the model simulates its own weather and climate from those boundary conditions. So on this side, I have this um, graph that's showing the forcing in watts per meter squared um, for 1850 to 2000 and something. Um, so you can see that the green line, this is greenhouse gases. So it has a positive and increasing forcing. So that is that causes warming. And then for instance, the gray line, this is volcanic eruptions. And so they cause like a short cooling effect. And I'll say a bit more about them on the next slide. If you look very carefully, you can see that there's this orange line that's um, solar variability. So there's like an 11 year solar cycle that has quite a small effect compared to some of the other things. And the pink is, is aerosols. So you, there's a number of different aerosols and they interact with uh, radiation in different ways. So some of them actually cause warming and some of them reflect sunlight and cause cooling. So on average, they cause cooling and you have a direct effect, which is that the aerosols interact directly with radiation, or you have an 
indirect effect, which is where they have an influence on clouds, like through being cloud condensation nuclei, which can affect the number of droplets that you have in clouds, which affects how they interact with radiation. Um, and then this black line, which you might struggle to see, this is orbital forcing. So on the time scale of a couple of centuries or so, orbital forcing is not really important. But if we were interested in going really far back in the past on really long time scales, then orbital forcing would also be something which affects the climate. So that's things like the Earth wobbling on its axis or, or to do with the orbit of the Earth around the sun, the shape of the orbit, things like that. So volcanic eruptions, so this is Mount Pinatubo, which erupted in 1991. You can see it has a really big plume of ash or, and gases and, and other materials. So if you have a really big eruption, which um, managed to get sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere, then it can affect the climate. So if the aerosols get into the stratosphere, they, they tend to linger around for a couple of years and they spread out and encircle the globe and then they reflect sunlight and that causes a global cooling. And you also get a decrease in global precipitation, although it depends a bit where you are because in some places it increases and in some places it decreases because um, the atmospheric circulation is affected. So for instance, monsoon precipitation tends to decrease after a big eruption. So um, on this side, I have a time series of volcanic aerosol optical depth from 1870 to 2000, for two, there's two different data sets here, but you can see that um, these spikes, these are the big eruptions of like Pinatubo style eruptions. So this is Pinatubo, and then this is Agung, this is El Chichon, um, and it's Nova Rupta, Santa Maria, and Tambora. So those are the most important ones that we um, simulate in, in climate models if we're looking at say 1850 onwards. And then we have um, solar cycles. So this is this 11 year cycle that I was talking about before. Uh, so this graph is from 1945 to 2015. And so at the moment we're in kind of a, a low, I read that we're just coming out into another sort of higher period and on this side, um, this is to illustrate that um, we have the so sunspots, the number of sunspots are, is correlated with the cycle. So in the past, people have tried to reconstruct what solar activity was but based on observations of sunspots. Okay, so this slide is um, basically I want to show that you can investigate what the effects of different external forcing agents are by running climate model simulations with and without different forcing agents. And, and this is an example from the IPCC AR5 report where it's a graph of global mean temperature. Um, so we have observations in black, so you can see that it increases through time. And then in the colors, we have two different model ensembles, so CMIP3 and CMIP5, so they're multimodal experiments. And in this graph, they, they're forced with all forcing, so that's greenhouse gases, aerosols, volcanoes, solar, and so on. And you can see that they match this overall trend pretty well. In this graph, the models are only forced by natural variability, sorry, natural forcing, so um, volcanoes and solar, so you can see the volcanoes but you can also see that it doesn't capture this warming trend and in this graph we had greenhouse gas only simulations and with only greenhouse gases the models actually warm more than what we observe so some of the other forcing agents are, are counteracting the greenhouse gas effect to a certain extent okay so that was all past forcing so for the future we don't know what will happen exactly. So we have scenarios. So we, yeah, we don't know how much greenhouse gases we will emit. It depends on our efforts to mitigate and reduce our greenhouse gases. So these different scenarios are, are representing different future pathways of what we might do. 
So the worst one, SSP 585, this is if we still emit lots and then SSP 1.19 is if we're like really good and reduce our emissions loads. And you can see this graph is temperature. So the ones with the biggest the anthropogenic radiative forcing that includes um, CO2, but it also includes aerosols and other greenhouse gases. But the ones with the most forcing, they have the biggest temperature change and, and so on. So SSPs are used in CMIP6, which is this uh, model and a comparison project. This is the current project, but the former one, CMIP5, that used RCPs, which are just formulated a bit differently. And, and Yana will talk about this um, next week. So, so that was it for external forcing. So before I move on to internal variability, I just <laughs> wondered if there were any questions. Let me check the, uh... oh, I don't know where to find it. Oh, here. There's nothing in the chat. So okay. hopefully everything is clear, but until now, <laughs> maybe we should continue, yes. Okay. So I move on, but of course you can, type a question at any time. So internal variability, this is kind of, in some ways it's the opposite of external forcing. So if I go back to this figure, you'll see that there's a lot of wiggles. So you have the overall trend, but then you have a lot of wiggles and this is internal variability. Um, so this is another example, maybe a cleaner example because it only uses one model instead of lots of models. Um, so this is a time series of global mean land precipitation from an ensemble of had CM3 uh, simulations. So an ensemble is just a group of model simulations running the same experiment. And you can see that, so the gray lines are all the different ensemble members and the red is observations and maybe just ignore the orange for now. And this, so the gray lines, you can see they have a lot of variability and you also see that the variability is not the same in each run, even though it's the same model. And we expect this because each simulation has its own kind of weather and short-term variability. And the way that we generate this kind of ensemble is um, we take the initial conditions and we introduce a small perturbation. And because the atmosphere is chaotic, it's very sensitive to small changes that this causes the variability to diverge really quickly between the model simulations. So this is a, a more kind of schematic illustration of the same thing. So we have our starting conditions. You see that they're slightly different. And it's okay to start with the two, let's pretend these are model simulations. The two simulations start off a bit similar and then they diverge and by the end they're completely different. So that's the kind of thing which is happening. If we started from exactly the same point, then they would follow the exact same trajectory. Um, so on this slide, I wanted to illustrate what role internal variability can have when we're looking at trends, particularly short-term trends, and, and also it helps us to interpret the observational record because that also contains internal variability. So in this, this paper, it's based on a 40-member ensemble of the model CCSM3 and showing 55-year winter temperature trends over North America. So if you take the average trend over all 40 models, this is the pattern that you get, so warming everywhere, but particularly in, in the north. And, but then you can also pick the, the ensemble member which has the strongest warming and the one which has the least strong warming and, and you can compare them. So you see that both they have warming overall, but this one has like a cooling <laughs> hole just here and this one is pretty hot in this area. And so these differences are just due to internal variability. And on, on this side, um, in black, we have observational time series. So there's three locations in the US, um, well, not the US, North America. And so um, you can see that the amount of variability depends on where you are. So in Mazatlan, in Mexico, there is less internal variability than there is in Seattle. And that's fairly typical that tropical regions tend to have less variability than high latitude regions. And um, you'll also notice if we look at the scale of the globe, then internal variability 
it's quite a lot smaller and that's because if it's hot in one area it's generally cold somewhere else and, and so the variability tends to cancel out spatially. We also have here at the end of these time series it's showing for each place the ensemble member with the strongest trend and the one with the weakest trend and um, you can imagine that there are say 38 ensemble members in between the two so these are just the two extremes so it's just to illustrate you know, what range of trends you can get just due to internal variability but probably if we extended the time series longer then maybe this one would then kind of slow down a bit maybe this one would start accelerating and and then all the rest of the simulations are in the middle but it's it's just to illustrate that these are two equally plausible um, future scenarios and the observed record would also have variability as well which could affect short-term trends so maybe you have like a period of reduced warming and then you have a period of really fast warming and that's mostly due to internal variability so i just talk um, a bit about a couple of examples of where this variability is coming from so here we have the el nino southern oscillation so it's it's in the equatorial Pacific and it's to do with the sea surface temperatures. So this is in like normal conditions, neutral conditions. So we have a, a warm pool of water um, near Indonesia, Australia is just kind of over here. And then on the other side of the Pacific, we have cold water upwelling and this affects the weather patterns. So over the warm pool, we have warm air which rises and, and condenses and so we have rain and then over the other side the air is sinking so we don't have much rain and then in El Nino years this warm pool that moves towards the east so then the rain follows it and then we have dry sinking air over over the west pacific instead so this affects you know, whether you have droughts or, or floods in, in various places but its effects are not just um, limited to the pacific I just realized I forgot to say that El Nino is basically an exaggerated version of the neutral state. So the warm pool moves even further this way. Sorry, La Nina is an exaggerated version of this. So um, these, these uh, plots are just illustrating where La Nina and El Nino have effects across the world. So it's not just in, around the Pacific, it's also further away and we call these teleconnections, these remote effects. So another example of, of one of these modes of variability is the North Atlantic Oscillation. So, and so it's got to do with the pressure um, between, pressure gradient between Iceland and the Azores. So in the, the positive phase, we have a strong low pressure over Iceland and a strong high pressure over the Azores. And this affects where the storm tracks go so um, in a positive phase, the storm tracks kind of directed more towards the north. So it becomes wet over northern Europe and dry over southern Europe. And we have the opposite pattern over North America. In the negative phase, we have the opposite happening. So now the pressure gradient is weak and the storm tracks tend to go further to the south. So it's now wet in the south and dry in the north. And again, the opposite in North America. So this is a time series of the NAO index from 1860 to present. So you have years where it's positive and years where it's negative, and then you have some clusters of years where it's positive or, or negative, and, and all this has an effect on the year to year climate. Um, so, are there any questions at the moment? There is nothing in the chat. Okay. Okay, so then I, I say a bit more about ensembles. So there are initial conditions ensembles, as I said before. So that's like single models where they have different variability. And then you have large initial conditions ensembles where you have, say, 50 to 100 members. And um, there's an example, like a really extreme example, is this climate prediction.net where um, basically, you can volunteer your computer, <laughs> um, and basically, they could, you can have climate models running on your computer, and then they kind of feedback the results to.
somewhere centralized and by having lots of volunteers you can run lots of ensemble members so I put thousands of members but probably there's more than this I just <laughs> wasn't able to find the number um, so yeah you can get really large ensembles like that and the multi-model ensembles are the other main important type of ensembles so this would be things like CMIP 5 and CMIP 6 so you have coordinated experiments or the modeling centers do the same experiment and then you can compare what the models are like. Uh, so in this plot I wanted to show um, how much spread in future projections you cover by using an initial conditions ensemble versus a multi-model ensemble. So I'll just explain what this is showing. So the top panel this is TXX, which is the annual maximum, the daily maximum temperature. So it's basically the hottest temperature of the year. And it's for Southern Europe and the Mediterranean from uh, about 2000-ish to 2060. And it's showing the trends that you have in, in all the ensemble members. So blue is an initial, di uh, initial conditions ensemble, so it's CESM. The 21 simulations and then in red we have seen five which is the multi-model ensemble so the the cones like the colored shading this is showing the range of trends that you get from cesm and cmip 5 so you can see that cesm only covers part of the range of uncertainty and if we use cmip 5 then we get a bigger range so it's um telling us that if we only use one model, then we're not covering the full range of uncertainty. Maybe if we use a different model, we might get a different answer. So that's um, something important to bear in mind. And you'll see there's two cones. This is just if we look at like a shorter time period, then our trends tend to be more kind of sensitive um, to, I don't know, you get a bigger spread in trends if you look at shorter time periods. So it's kind of the same result, but bit more spread and then in the second plot we kind of see the same phenomenon so this is rx five day so that's the annual maximum of five day consecutive precipitation so in other words it's the wettest five consecutive days of the year and this is projections for eastern north america and again you see that if you're using a single model you you cover this range of uncertainty and if you use the whole CMIP 5 ensemble, then you get a bigger range of possible trends. Okay, so I'll try to explain these figures. This is quite a famous paper, the Hawkins and Sutton papers. Um, they're all about uncertainty and, and dividing spread in projections into different sources. So if I start on this side, um, maybe with the top one, so this is global mean precipitation, um, but it's decadal mean precipitation anomaly. So it's projections. Well, this bit is the historical period, but from here it's projections. So from 1960 to 2100. And um, so you can imagine there's a whole load of projections from different models <laughs> behind this graph, but this is just showing the spread and it's dividing the spread into different sources. So the orange line is the, the uncertainty you get from internal variability which is pretty small at the global scale and it remains constant through time. And then blue is the uncertainty from your choice of model. So different models have different, the different like setups, maybe they're different resolution or they include different processes or the parameterizations are a bit different. And so you get like a range of possible results. And then the scenario uncertainty, so from the choice of scenario is, in green so for precipitation you can see that the scenario uncertainty grows over time so at the beginning it's not really that important um, but for precipitation the model uncertainty so the blue is the most important source of uncertainty at the end of the century for temperature the picture is a little bit different although not not hugely different so we have the same kind of internal variability as a small effect and stays constant over time. Um, model uncertainty in this case is actually a bit smaller than scenario uncertainty. So for global mean temperature, scenario uncertainty is the most important source of uncertainty at the end of the century. 
So the plot on this side is, is basically showing the same information, but slightly differently. Um, so it's showing the total variance, so the spread and projections over time. So it corresponds to this temperature graph. So you can see again that internal variability is very small proportion of the spread and the model uncertainty gets a bit bigger over time and scenario uncertainty becomes really huge compared to the others at the end of the century. But on this um, figure, you also see you have these two kind of inset figures. So um, this is basically this period, so not to 20 years of a projection, and it's just expanded so you can see it better. So it's showing the, the difference if you look at a decadal mean, which is what all these plots are based on, versus an annual mean. So if you look at an annual mean, then the variability is much more important. And then if you look at a smaller spatial scale, so North America instead of the globe, then internal variability becomes even more important. So internal variability becomes most important at small spatial scales and at short time scales. So Carly, excuse me, we have one question. Uh, okay. It's in the chat, it's from Ra. Uh, do you want me to read it or will you read? I can't, I can't see it. Okay, I can read it for you. What is the most significant overall differences in the results between CMI uh, P5 and CMI P6? Um, it would be helpful if I could see the <laughs> question. I have trouble kind of visualizing it otherwise. Carly, um, yes. yeah, I'll just run, run the question past you. So okay. I, I'm just basically asking what you think is the biggest difference um, in terms of the results presented from CMIP5 and from CMIP6. So um, okay. in, in, in short, what do we need to know that's new and, and different in the, the latest set of scenarios compared <laughs> with the former set? I mean, I, I know there's a, there's a lot still underway, but what's your sense? I'm not sure if I have a good answer <laughs> to that question, actually. I and mean, I know some assume that six models have a higher climate sensitivity, um, but I don't know whether that means, I don't know which are the most accurate, they just, yeah, some which show a bigger response to mm. greenhouse gases. And I mean, of course, things like resolutions are higher and all that, but in terms of what like the take home messages between the two ensembles, I'm, I can't really answer that, I'm afraid. Okay, so you're basically saying that there's evidence that um, some some of the upper end temperature projections might be nudged upwards in CMIP six, although they do come from models that are perhaps on the warm end and maybe I mean how trustworthy are they? They raise questions like that. I think. Well, indeed, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know how trustworthy they are. I think yeah, people are probably looking into this. I'm not really totally up to date with okay. it. But of course, not all models are higher sensitivity in CMIP6. It's just uh, some of them are. Yeah. OK. Thanks, Carly. OK. All right. So I move on to CMIP then, which is quite. Sorry, Carly, there is one another question. OK. Elita, how far in the future can we predict uh, North Atlantic constellation or answer? Uh, can a solar 11 year cycle help us predict it? So um, the NAO and ENSO, they're not very predictable. We can't really predict them very far ahead at all. Um, maybe like for ENSO, perhaps one season or something. So, I mean, we know that ENSO oscillations will carry on in the future, but we can't predict exactly like when that will happen. Um, and there was a second bit, the solar cycle. Um, I'm not sure that this, Solar. So this isn't really my, my strong point, this, the, the influence of the solar on climate, but I don't think it affects ENSO and the NAO. I'm not really, I'm not really sure. I think there are some influences of solar in the northern hemisphere, um, which could include the NAO, I guess, but I would I would have to check. Yeah, because I'm I'm not sure. Thank you. Okay, so. I move on to CMIP then, um, which is, leads on nicely from Rob's question. So yeah, CMIP is the coupled model into comparison project and uh, we're currently on CMIP 6. Um, so, I mean, there have been other phases before this, obviously, so CMIP 5, 
there wasn't any CMIP4 and there was a CMIP3 and before that was <laughs> before my time so I'm less sure of what happened in the earliest CMIPs but they would generally become more complicated over time there's like more experiments involved so yes they run a standardized set of experiments um, you have maybe 30 modeling centers that contribute uh, one or more models because some modeling centers have more than one model. And um, on this side, this is basically a diagram showing all the different experiments that can be run. I mean, not everybody does every experiment because that would be, it would take a lot of time to run all these different experiments. It's not feasible to do everything, but there are certain experiments that everyone has to do. So um, we have this DEC, which stands for uh, Diagnostic Evaluation and Characterization of Klima, <laughs> because the acronym didn't work by just having one language. Um, and then we have historical simulations that everyone has to do. So the historical simulations are basically from 1850 to present, and they contain observed um, forcings from greenhouse gases and volcanic aerosols and solar and anthropogenic aerosols and so on. So we're trying to recreate what the climate did in the past and we can compare them with observational records. And this deck, um, this is more kind of like diagnostic experiments. It helps you to really understand your climate model's behavior. So we have AMIP simulation. This is atmosphere only simulation. It's forced by observed records of sea surface temperatures. And then we have a pre-industrial control simulation. So this is a really long simulation. So it's like a few hundred years long or maybe even a bit longer. And it just has constant pre-industrial forcings. So that helps us to explore what internal variability does in the model without the influence of volcanoes going off and, and stuff like that. And it can also help us to identify whether our model drifts, that is whether it kind of has a trend through time which is not related to external forcing. And um, there's a 1% per year CO2 increase experiment, so that's if you increase CO2 very gradually through time, and then there's also an abrupt four times CO2 experiment, so that's if you suddenly quadruple CO2 levels, what does your model do? So it's obviously not very realistic, but it's uh, still interesting. And then scenario myth is um, something which I think is one of the most important uh, MIPs. We call these subprojects MIPs. The so scenario myth is the one where you, you have the different scenarios um, which you use to make future projections. So we, we make a, a lot of use of these. And then I'll just mention a couple of these other MIPs. Um, so geo myth is, is one way you look at the effect of geoengineering on the climate. So if you were to artificially put sulfate aerosols in the, to the stratosphere, for example, to replicate uh, the effect of a volcano, then what would happen? And there's other geoengineering techniques too, but that's the one <laughs> that I, I'm most aware of. And then there's things like DA MIP, this is detection and attribution MIP. So for this, there would be model simulations for just one forcing agent, like just greenhouse gases or just aerosols or just volcanoes, then that helps us to really see what that particular force and agent does, what effects it has. PMIP, that's paleoclimate. So that's if we go really far back in time. And then this is the last one. I'll mention high res MIP. That's an experiment to see what happens if you run your global models at the highest resolution you can manage, which at the moment is 25 kilometers for, for climate projections. And then you compare it to lower resolution models, the same model, but at lower resolution and, and see what effect that had. And you can download uh, data from CMIP6 or CMIP5 or, or CMIP3 even from the ESGF. Um, so Maritz will, um, will give a demonstration of this next week, um, but you can search for what you want on this side, like the experiment and the variable and the model, and then you get lots of um, results and you can add them to your data cart and you can download them and then start analyzing them. 
So I thought I would just show some uses of the, the uh, CMIP-5 simulations. Um, so this is, we're going to show a few plots from the IPCC AR5 report. So IPCC is Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And every few years they, they um, make this big report, which is basically um, outlining its, yeah, describing our knowledge about the climate system. So, and what we know about projections and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's very interesting and they make a lot of use of CMIP simulations. So for example, this graph is showing global surface temperature change from 1850 to 2300, so quite far in the future. And then we have different RCPs, so those are the scenarios shown in colors. So, I mean, most of the time we only tend to look up to 2100. And you can see that um, if we, you know, the worst case scenario where we keep em emitting lots, we might reach, say, four degrees with an upper bound of, of five, which is quite a lot. Or if we did really like, um, strong mitigation, then maybe we could stay more like a, a one or something. And then if you go further in the future, then <laughs> it looks really crazy, this RCP 8.5. Uh, that's going up to eight degrees with uncertainty far above 12. So I don't think we really want to go there. Um, but we don't have so many models which simulate all the way out to 2,300. So these numbers are showing the number of simulations for each scenario and so we have a lot more models that only go to 2100. Um, here this is annual mean surface air temperature change. Um, so we have the different RCPs, so 2.6, 4.5, 6 and 8.5 and then we have two different time periods. So this is mid-century on this side and end of century and um, so yeah, we're, you see the, the warming, you see that it's uh, stronger at the end of the century than the mid-century, and also that it's stronger under RCP 8.5 compared to the other RCPs. You'll notice that there's all these dots, and um, I wonder if anybody can guess what the dots mean. And maybe this isn't the best setup for, <laughs> for asking questions to, to the audience. So I'll just, I'll just tell you what the dots mean. The dots are um, basically where you have high model agreement. So if 90% of models agree on the sign of change, and also if the change is outside of internal variability, so if the change is bigger than two standard deviations of internal variability, then we put a dot. So where there's dots, it, we think the projections are pretty robust. Um, so for temperature, almost everywhere is dotted. And then I just show you um, some individual models, just so you can see how much the models differ or don't differ. So all of them agree on warming. Some of them have stronger warming than others. Some of them even have <laughs> cooling. Um, I'm not quite sure what's with that, unless I suppose internal variability might still be playing a role, but maybe not so much for a 20 year mean. Um, so yes, there you go. And then this is precipitation. So the plots are arranged a bit differently this time. So we have um, winter, spring, summer, autumn, and then two time periods in so mid-century, end of century, and this is for RCP 8.5. So um, I mean, the main difference compared to temperature is that it's not a uniform pattern everywhere. So we have areas where it's getting wetter. These are generally the areas which are, all, are already wet. So like the tropics and the high latitudes. And then we have some areas which are getting drier. And again, these are, tend to be the areas which are already dry. So we, we have some areas where we have dots, so high model agreement and the signal emerging from the variability, but we also have a lot of areas with this hatching, which means that the, the change signal is, is small compared to variability. So if we say it hasn't emerged yet. The, the take home message is, is that changes in precipitation are not, we're not so certain about them as we are about 
temperature, although for some regions we're more certain, the ones with the dots. And over time, so in the mid-century, we have more areas with this hatching because the change signal is smaller. So then I just have one more example. This is sea ice extent in the northern hemisphere in February. So we have our various projections. They tend to agree that sea ice is decreasing, but the amount of decrease depends on the scenario. But then we also have a fair amount of, of spread due to, well, mostly model uncertainty, I expect. OK, so that was it for projections. I mean, Bojana, if there's any questions, can you <laughs> interrupt me and tell me because I yes. don't see them. Yes, we have a question. Do you think we should trust the IPCC projections as they show really far future? Uh, should we trust the IPCC projections in the far future? Is that right? Um, yes. well, we have such a big range of what could happen all the way from zero to, to I don't know what that goes up to, more than 12. So, I mean, probably the, the truth is somewhere in between those two values, but yeah, to pin it down is I mean, we can't really, because we don't know which scenario we're going to follow. And even if we did, if it was this one, we still have a huge range. So, yeah, I guess we can't be like totally certain about what will happen, but I think we can be fairly confident it will be somewhere within this range. But I mean, that's not really a hard criteria to be uh, satisfied. Thank you. Okay, so then I wanted to say something fairly quick about model evaluation and biases. In Yana, we'll say more about this um, next week, but I just wanted to say that it's important to evaluate your model, not just assume that it's accurate. We often find actually that the multimodal mean is closer to observations than any single model. So some of the biases seem to cancel out and then some internal variability will also cancel out but um, there's also systematic biases so this means biases which are common to most models or all models we have to bear in mind also that the observations that we compare the models against are also not perfect and maybe there's some uncertainty coming from the choice of observational data set that you compare with so some examples of common model biases are the double ITCZ in the Pacific. So the ITCZ, that's the intertropical convergence zone. And so on the top, you have a, a model simulation from the NCAR model. And in the Pacific, you see you have these two kind of lines of heavy precipitation. And in the observations, you just have one where you have like a small bit coming down here, but it's not like extending really far across the Pacific. And this is this is what we call the double ITCZ problem. And a lot of models seem to do this. We also have a drizzle problem. That's to say that the climate models tend to have too much um, light precipitation. So instead of not raining, they might have kind of really light rain. They also tend to underestimate extreme precipitation um, unless you go to really high resolution and then they don't. In fact, they sometimes have too much <laughs> instead. And we also, the jet stream tends to be too zonal. So what that means is if here, so this is the North Atlantic, the jet stream should kind of have like this diagonal slant, but often it's a bit too straight. And that affects where like storms and stuff go. Climate models also tend to have underestimated blocking frequency. So blocking frequency, well, Blocking is when you have, say, a high pressure system which stays in one place for a long time and it can be associated with heat waves and cold spells. So if you underestimate the blocking frequency, then maybe you might have some trouble simulating heat waves and cold spells quite as well as you could. OK, so I move on to regional climate models unless there's any questions. So far, nothing in the chat, so thank you. Okay, um, so, so regional climate models simulate a region, unsurprisingly. And so here's a 
a diagram of how this works. So maybe we simulate Europe and by simulating just a, a region at higher resolution, we can reach that resolution at less cost than if we simulated the whole globe at the same resolution. So we might have, so for an area this big, maybe it will be at 50 kilometers to 10 kilometers resolution. It, the regional model takes the boundary conditions from the global model. So you, you also have to have a simulation of a global model at, at lower resolution. And then the regional model takes information about say, I don't know, uh, pressure, winds, temperature, and so on as its boundaries. And then it, it can do its own thing in the middle. We can also force it with a, a reanalysis instead of the global model. So reanalysis is kind of like a pseudo observational data set, which I'll talk about later, but it's a combination of observations and a weather model. But the idea is that it's supposed to be a bit like an observational data set. And by doing that, we can get the regional model to kind of follow the sequence of, a, of weather events, more or less that happened in real life, maybe not quite the same because it can also deviate a bit within this um, zone, but more similar than a climate, a global model would. And we call this process of going from low to high resolution in this way, dynamical downscaling. And so the regional model, the higher resolution, it um, provides better representation of mountains and coastlines. So that can help with simulating some processes. Depending on the resolution of your model, you might um, be able to simulate the larger scales of convection if you're quite high resolution. And um, yes, it inherits its large scale atmospheric circulation from the global model. So if your global model has problems with its large scale circulation, then your regional model will inherit that. So um, there's also a coordinated experiment for regional models, so like CMIP, but for regional models, so called CORDEX, which is the Coordinated Regional Climate Downscaling Experiment. And in this map, you can see all the different domains that they simulate. So there's a lot of them nowadays. It's a figure is starting to get quite complicated to look at. Um, but say Europe is one of the domains which has the most simulations. So for Europe, there are, uh, say, 11 regional models, like 11 different ones simulating, sorry, downscaling eight um, CMIP5 models. But for the other domains, it tends to be a bit less. So some of them, maybe they have uh, two RCMs downscaling, three GCMs. And um, so the resolution is generally either 50 kilometers or 25 kilometers. Over Europe, um, there's a, a large ensemble, which is 12 kilometers. And they tend to, so they follow the CMIP5 protocol to a certain extent. So they use the historical simulations and then they have the RCPs 2.6, 4.5, 8.5, and then they also do an evaluation simulation where they're forced by error interim, which is a reanalysis. So that helps us to understand how well they're performing without introducing further uncertainties from using a global model, which itself might have some issues. And then like a really extreme version of uh, regional models is these convection permitting models. So these are super high resolution. They can, they're generally less than four kilometer resolution. And when you get to these kind of resolutions, you can turn off your convection parameterization scheme. So here I, I have like an example of a mesoscale convective system over the UK. Um, so this is showing the instantaneous rainfall rates. So this is the radar image, so it's what really happened. So we have this system over southern England, and then we have a forecast with a 1.5 kilometer model. And you can see that it actually looks pretty good. It looks quite similar to this system. Like the shape of it is kind of similar and the intensities of the precipitation are similar too. But if we look at a forecast with a 25 kilometer model, then then it really doesn't look as good. So we don't reach the same intensities. And of course we can't simulate the same sort of shape or the detail of the shape. 
So in convection permitting models and um, precipitation, extremes tend to get heavier. They can actually sometimes get too heavy <laughs> if at really high resolution. But we have to also pay attention to the resolution of the observational data set because um, for a station based data set, you tend to actually find higher precipitation extremes if you have a higher station density. Um, the diurnal cycle of convection tends to be improved in convection permitting models. Uh, so generally convection happens at a certain time of day and global models or course models, they tend to get that time of day wrong. And the intensities of hourly precipitation are improved in convection permitting models. But the main problem is that they're really expensive to run. So the domains are generally pretty small. It's not really possible to do ensembles and it's not really possible to do long-term climate projections. Um, however, there are coordinated convection permitting experiments starting to appear. So an example is this Cordex flagship project on convection permitting models. So there are, I think in the paper, it said 27 modeling centers had promised they would do um, these simulations and maybe some of them run the same model. So there's maybe eight models. There might be more than that now, I'm not sure. And they, they agreed that they'll all simulate this domain. They're still quite small, but for convection permitting models, it's quite big actually. And, um, and for, in terms of climate projections, they can just afford to run time slices, so like 10 year time slices. So for the, for the recent past, so 1996 to 2005, and then the mid century, and then the end of century. So, so yeah, things are, are progressing and computing power increases all the time. So what we can do uh, increases too. So this is kind of the, the best <laughs> shot that we have at the moment with the convection permitting models. And then I just wanted to have one slide on um, the difference between weather versus climate models. So in fact, actually, weather and climate models are very similar. Sometimes they actually use the same model. Um, but weather models are often higher resolution and, and weather model, the weather models observations are really important. So weather models tend to simulate observations every few hours to start a new forecast, whereas climate models, we just put in some observations at the beginning and then, then it can do its own thing for the rest of the century. Um, but this is because for weather models, we, we want to simulate you know, the weather as it will actually happen, not just some random variability, because that would be kind of not very helpful. So the phase of internal variability is, is important for weather models and not climate models. Um, and weather simulations are short, maybe a couple of weeks maximum in general versus a century for the climate models. But for both, ensembles are important. So on this side, this is just to illustrate the use of ensembles in, in weather models. Maybe you do your forecast and you have, in this case, 23 members and they will simulate a a low pressure system over um, Scandinavia. And um, how similar all these members are gives you an idea of how certain we are about the forecast. So if they all show something really similar, then we can be quite sure about what the weather will do. And if they show something quite different, then we know that, that we're not <laughs> so sure what the weather will do and forecasts can be phrase to, to reflect that uncertainty. Um, so this reanalysis next, so I just pause and see if there are any questions. Uh, yes, there are three questions in the chat. I can read it for you or, or you can uh, read it. Uh, can you read it, uh, Carly, or should I read it for you? Um, it would be good if I could read it, but I just can't. Oh, here, <laughs> I, found, I found them. <laughs> That's good. Uh, let's see. So it's the last. It's yes. It's uh, no, no, no. three. Um, not the last, but uh, two up. It's from Rasko. Is there some global model that excludes city gorges? Because most of the do you see it? Yeah. Okay. So is there some models that exclude city gauges? Because most of gauges were out of cities, and now cities go over them. 
and have much microclimate influence. We also see that on oceans, we have much less temperature increase in almost all predictions. This is influenced by the number of city gauges. So actually for a climate model, we don't take in data. I mean, apart from setting the starting point for it to start from after that, we don't take in any data. So it does its own thing. So the number of gauges, it doesn't make any difference. Um, in terms of the ocean, yes, we do see less warming over the ocean. And I'm trying to remember <laughs> why that is. Um, it could be that because the ocean has a lower heat capacity than the land. Although I have vague memories that maybe that wasn't the reason, but I can't actually remember right now. I don't know if anybody else can. But probably the variability above the ocean because the water needs uh, more time to, to cool and more time to get warmer. So that's, that can be one of the reasons why the variability is lower. But the other, also the, the, on land, you have a greater variability because land gets uh, warm quickly, quicker than, than water. So that's, that's something, yes. Some, some, some common sense from my side. Yeah, well, there's not so much the variability, it's the overall change. But anyway, yes, so the heat capacity thing would be my first answer on that, but to be checked. Um, okay, and then I'm interested to know how exactly do you put in your model the extent of the land? If you're working with PMIP regional models, you need to adjust the coast to fit, for example, the Ice Age land extent, which is different from nowadays. Uh, yes, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't really know how they put the land in models, but it would make sense to me if you're looking at really far back in the past that you would need to adjust the land. So, yeah, that's all I can say about that. Okay, so I will move on. Question. Oh, there's another one. Oh, okay, sorry. No, sorry, that's, 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 that's already been answered. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I will start um, the reanalysis. So this is the, the last part. Oh, this is not full screen. Okay, now it is. Okay, so reanalyses are kind of a hybrid between models and observations. The observational data has gaps and reanalyses combine observations with weather models to fill in the gaps. And so we end up with a 3D data set. So it has um, data in the vertical as well as on the surface. So it's like 3D complete data set, which would not be something we could achieve only with observations. And here in this figure, I just wanted to show how some, some data availability changes through time. So from 1871 to 1900, we have a lot of um, stations in North America and Europe. I forgot to say that this is for the GHCN data set. And um, through time, this coverage improves. So by the end, well, by like the recent past, we have quite a lot of observations, but we have areas with big gaps too, like over the Sahara, for example, and of course over Greenland. Um, so a reanalysis can, can give us data where we have gaps and it does it in a more sophisticated way than just interpolating the data because we're using information generated by a weather model. So this is kind of a diagrammatic representation of the process. So we have our global observing system with lots of different types of measurements. So we have um, satellites and, and sensors on airplanes and on boats and on Argo floats in the ocean, things like Stevenson screens, LIDAR, radar, weather balloons, and uh, data from all these different sources can be combined with a, a weather model to reconstruct what the weather did over the over the years in the past. So a reanalysis provides um, physically and spatially consistent fields. 
we have to use a consistent setup through time. So you don't want to suddenly change something about the way that you make your reanalysis. So for example, you don't want to suddenly change the weather model that you use, or you don't want to suddenly include satellite observations when you didn't have satellite observations before. You don't want to suddenly change your data assimilation technique. The idea is to be as consistent through time as you can be with these things. And then, however, the coverage of the input observations obviously does change through time. And then the process of combining the observations with the model is called data assimilation. So there's various different um, ways of doing this, different algorithms of different complexities. And you assimilate variables like temperature, pressure, humidity, and wind. So the observing system has evolved through time. So back in 1890, we just had surface observations but then over time at a certain point weather balloons started to become um, started to be used and then around the 70s then satellites satellite observations were used so nowadays we have a lot more observations of varying types compared to what we did back in 1890. So I tried to explain the data assimilation process in a fairly conceptual way. So in this uh, figure, we have so the model simulation, the weather model is in blue, and then we have observational data points, and then the green is the reanalysis. So we start off our weather model by initializing it with the observational data that we have, and then it, it runs for, this is um, for 12 hours, and then we take that, um, forecast, as it were, and we adjust it with information from the observations to try and, and bring it down to something more realistic. And then after 12 hours, we, we start the weather forecast again, because it's kind of quite different from reality by this point. So we reinitialize it and we set it going again, and then we adjust it again with the observations that we have so that it follows something more like what really happened and then we repeat the process and, and so on and so on. Uh, what did I want to say? Um, so the, the influence that these observations have, so they have more influence when there's a lot of observations and in areas where there's not so many observations then the, the, the weather simulation has kind of more weight. So from a reanalysis, it outputs all kinds of different variables like pressure, humidity, temperature, winds, precipitation, cloud cover, snow depth, and, and much more. But we tend to have more confidence in the variables that are assimilated compared to those produced by the model. So precipitation, for example, is just produced by the model. We don't assimilate it, so therefore we have less confidence about it. And on this side, so I'm just showing in this column, this is error interim, so this is a reanalysis. And then on this side, we have some observational data sets. Um, so for two meter temperature, for specific humidity, and for precipitation. So you can compare the, the two, and the idea is that the reanalysis should look like the observations where we have them. So I think this is the case for this top plot. And of course, the reanalysis um, generates data where we didn't have any from just observations. And there's the same story with, with the other variables. So yeah, this looks pretty similar to this where we have observations and then we fill in the other areas using the weather model and precipitation. It also looks quite similar. Um, maybe we have some differences, but yes, yeah, so the reanalysis is doing its job. And I wanted to mention specifically this uh, 20th century reanalysis. So this is a reanalysis. It's a bit special because it um, tries to go back in as far in time as we can. So it starts in 1836. And because we want the type of observations we simulate, assimilate to be consistent through time, it only uses surface pressure because that's a variable which is more available than, than say, temperature. Um, and it also takes an observed record of sea surface temperature and, and sea ice. Um, 
so on this side, these are showing where the observations are that um, 20 CR, that's the short name for this 20th century reanalysis, that it assimilates. So in the beginning in 1854, you don't really have very many observations. And by the year 2000, we have lots of observations, although not everywhere. You see there's quite some gaps in, in Africa, for example. And nowadays, reanalyses, instead of just having one kind of best estimate, they tend to have an ensemble um, which wants to span observational uncertainty. So how different could your estimate be given the observations that you have? And I have a little video to illustrate. Um, so this is the 20th century reanalysis. So it has two different versions. So this is version 2C, and this is the current version, version three. And you can see that, um, so this is all the way back in 1918, and you can see how the, the pressure systems are moving around. You can see in the colors, you have the temperature, and then you have the little, little arrows here, which are the winds. And then you also have this, this kind of fog, and this fog, um, Philip Brohan, who made these animations, he calls it the fog of ignorance. So the fog is, is where we have a large spread of the ensemble members because we don't have very many observations. And so the idea is that this fog, there ought to be less fog in the version three compared to the version 2C. Um, I let you decide if that's actually true or not. It probably depends on when exactly we're simulating. So yes, that's 20 CR. Oh, how do I get out of here? Oh gosh, okay. Um, so now I'm just, I list some examples of uh, global reanalyses just to show what's out there. So for ECMWF, I put like a, a whole generation of reanalyses. So error 15 is quite an old one and it, it was replaced by error 40. Then we had error interim, then we had error five. So this is the current reanalysis. It's pretty high resolution compared to some of the older ones. We also have error 20C, which is um, ECMWF's version of the 20th century reanalysis. And then we have things like the NSEP NCAR reanalysis. I already mentioned this one, MERA 2 and JRA 55, that's the Japanese one. And there's also such a thing as as regional reanalyses, which I only discovered recently. Um, so they basically work in a similar way to the regional models. So you have a global reanalysis as the boundary conditions, and then you can use a RCM to downscale it and incorporate some high resolution observations to get to regional reanalysis, which is higher resolution than what you'd achieve with a global reanalysis. So examples include um, the North America one and SEPNA reanalysis, or there's an Arctic system reanalysis. UERA is one over Europe, and then South Asia reanalysis. And there are many more, but they're generally pretty high resolution compared to the global reanalysis. So I think that is actually my last slide. So before I talk about reading, <laughs> are there any more questions? Uh, there aren't any questions in the chat, so maybe somebody would like to ask it directly. There's no, nothing here from the classroom. Okay, well maybe I can talk about the reading then maybe if people have a chance to type something. So I listed quite a few different possible reading material and of course I don't expect that anybody would look at all of it, but it's more just to give you some options of, so you can pick something that you think sounds interesting or maybe pick a, a couple of things. So um, for instance, there's this, so introductions to climate modeling, I found this um, thing by Stocker, which looked pretty useful. It is an introduction to climate modeling, but it has a lot of emphasis on the physics. Um, so I didn't really say an awful lot, I didn't really say anything about physics. So if you want to know more about the physics, in the climate system with equations and so on, then this looks like a good introduction. And even if you don't really like equations and stuff, it's still 
has some pretty interesting looking material at the beginning. And this carbon brief article, that's really easy to read. It's quite a general introduction aimed at kind of a generalized audience all about climate models. Um, so I got some inspiration from there <laughs> when making this, this lecture. Um, and then there's some papers which I thought were pretty interesting. So these two are quite iconic papers, this end of model democracy thing by Reta Mitty. It's about whether, so generally ensemble, in ensembles, we give one vote to each model, often we do, and it's about whether we should do that or whether we should combine them in more sophisticated ways, but it's very interestingly written and it's not that long. This Hawkins and Sutton thing, that's um, what I presented, uh, Hang on, <laughs> it's quite a long way back. This, these plots come from, or well, this one comes from the Hawkins and Sutton paper. So I think it's pretty interesting. It's about uncertainty in climate projections um, and whether you can narrow it. Then this paper, this is quite a new one and it's about um, where we're at with convection permitting modeling and what the challenges are. And then I just put some of the key papers which describe these modeling initiatives, like um, this is Eurocodex, this is CMIP6, this is Scenario MIP, and this is um, describing that uh, project about convection permitting model ensembles. And then these two papers are about uh, two different reanalyses. So they can maybe be a bit heavy going, but just looking at the, the introduction and, and some parts of it that can still be interesting. And then I just wanted to recommend looking at some of the IPCC stuff. So I put here three, the three chapters I thought were most relevant to this lecture, but the IPCC reports are really interesting in my opinion. And I really recommend taking a look at least at a part of them. You don't need to look at the whole thing. I mean, the whole report is enormous. So there's no way you would manage that anyway, but just to, dip in and, and have a look at the figures and see what kind of thing is there. I think it's pretty interesting. So there you go.